Chapter 9, Coping with Suffering. There's an old story about a frog who fell into a butter churn, and no matter how high he jumped, the top was too high for him to reach. But as he was jumping, his webbed feet created the same up and down motion as the paddle until finally butter was formed and he could stand on it and jump out. Whether it happened or not, it brings out an important point. It's often possible to turn negative situations into positive. Never feel a situation is all negative. There's a counterpart that's positive. Look for it. Reach for it. Utilize it. It will offset the negative. If you don't think so, go into a dark room and strike one match. It dissipates the darkness immediately. Darkness seems like something that's hard to stand up against, but light is much stronger. Just a small light dispels the darkness. That's how it is with everything. If there's negativity all around, find the positive counterpart and utilize it. There are four great teachings in Buddhism. The very first of those teachings is that life is suffering. We think that it ought to be the other way around, that life should be easy, that it should be happy. That's what we seek. But the stark, dark reality is that life is suffering and coping with suffering gives meaning to life. It is what gives us our strength. Things may seem bleak at times. We stand outside at night and it's completely dark. We can't see the sun, the moon, or the stars. Then all of a sudden, a comet comes across the heavens and lets us know there's sun shining somewhere because we can only see a comet as it reflects light. In difficult times, we are made more aware of the resources that we have within ourselves and therein lies our peace. Peace is not the absence of conflict. It comes from the ability to cope with that conflict. And so in the darkest moments of your own life, never lose sight of the fact that the sun is going to shine through to a great day, a great life. Whatever your potential is, you can reach it. In the Bible, Jesus once said to his disciples, let us go over into Cavernum. So they got in a little boat, and as soon as Jesus went to sleep, on the way a fierce wind came up, and the disciples became frightened. As they woke Jesus, the first thing he did was to rebuke them, saying, O oh, ye of little faith. Then he talked to the winds, and the winds calmed down. What manner of man is he that even the winds obey him even though they were his disciples and were with him when he performed great feats they still never quite understood him why did he say ye of little faith jesus has a divine connection with the father so when he said let us go over into capernaum they would arrive in capernaum because he said they would but the disciples didn't take him at his word. They became frightened when they saw a sign of danger all around. And that's why ye of little faith meant, you have no faith in what I proclaim and what I can do. It's still hard for you. Jesus took care of that danger and there is still a power today that takes care and makes a way for us. More of us have very little faith. We say we do until something difficult happens and then we feel everything is hopeless. We try and try, we struggle, yet we feel like giving up sometimes thinking, well, this is it. 
This is the end. This is as far as I can go in life. At times like that, go to the ocean and watch the waves come in. The tide has a steady rhythm, a tempo that's never affected by the storms at sea. When the tide hits the shore, it goes as far inland as it can. And when it reaches its zenith, it's not the end. It's merely a turning point. It then flows back out to sea to where there's great strength and power. It doesn't matter how strong the storms might be out there. It does not affect the rhythm of the ocean as it comes in and turns. In our struggles, we may think we can't go any farther, not realizing that it's merely a turning point in our life. All power is available to us. You can turn things around in your own life, live hopefully, and keep that hope going. Dante wrote a story called The Inferno, in which a man takes an imaginary journey and comes to the gates of hell, where there's an inscription which reads, Abandon all hope, ye who enter here. If you arrive at such place, hope is out of your vocabulary. But suppose the judge who sentenced you says, after 2,000 years, I'll review your case. There's no guarantee the end result will be any different. And 2,000 years is a long time. But that gives you a thin thread of hope to hold on to. That's the power of the word hope. Live hopefully. It does not matter what happens, what your circumstances are. You have something to connect with. When you yourself cannot solve a problem, there's a problem solver available. Lie down on Mother Earth. She'll caress you. She still gives you energy. And she still says, look up to the Creator. Talk to Him. Pour your heart out. The answer will come. Not long ago, a woman called me and I went to see her in the hospital. She was a very young mother who had just given birth to a child with no arms. He had webbed feet and scars on his face and she was wondering, why me? Why me? I had to talk to her for a long time, pray with her, to show her that there was a blessing somewhere in her situation. In our culture, when such children are born, we say they are specially blessed. The Creator had a reason for bringing that child into the world, and we are helping the Creator when we make the child as comfortable as possible in every way. It's said there's a special blessing when we help someone like that. Although that's not our reason for doing it, my people don't even talk about the reasons. We just try to help. I told her the story of a similar situation where a little boy was born without arms and the doctor asked her husband to stay by his wife's bedside as she came out of sedation so he could tell her. When the time came, he looked at his wife and said, Mary, we have a beautiful baby boy. But Mary, he was born without arms. Mary lay there for a moment with her eyes closed. Then she opened them and with a beautiful smile on her face looked up into the eyes of her husband and said, John, God must have known how much he needed us. What I'm trying to get at is this. The most important thing is not the circumstance in life, but your reaction to those circumstances. How do you deal with difficulties? Do you resent or do you accept? Honor every situation. There is a reason why things like this happen. But don't be judgmental and put out a lot of blame. If it wasn't for this and for that, if something bad happened, how can you salvage it? How can you turn it from negative to positive? 
When you do that, then you can cope with anything that comes in life. When something terrible happens to you, say thank you, because there's a lesson there. Maybe at the time it's happening, you were so mad or upset you didn't consider a lesson. You wanted revenge and payback or to cover up and justify whatever it was. You missed the lesson altogether. If you got sick and almost died and then recovered, say thank you. Not just because you recovered, but because now you see someone else who is sick as you were, you can have compassion that you didn't have before. That was a lesson and you're grateful for it. I had a friend in Albuquerque who was a radio announcer. He came to see me one day. He was really dejected and told me I, I was fired. I said, that's good. What? That's good. What do you mean? I've been fired from my job. I have a family to support. I told him, this is going to make a new man out of you. Take iron ore. There's nothing you can do with it in its raw state. On the outside, it doesn't look good at all. So you put it in a foundry where it's heated many, many times until the crust falls off and the core is tempered. The end result is fine steel. And we say that it has been fired. Either we're going to stop with the crust still on or hang in there until it's broken away and we show the world this is the stuff I'm made of. When you're faced with difficult situations, the crust of ego burns away. Now it's going to show the real you. A lemon has to be squeezed first before it can make lemonade. They either squeeze the best out of you or the worst. It's up to you. So what does it mean when you're trying to do good and something bad happens. The one we refer to as God is not necessarily testing us, but he allows things to happen to show us what kind of character we're made of. Not too long ago in Los Angeles, the captain of one of the fire departments was having a prayer meeting in his home. A 17-year-old was at the meeting and her mother and nine-year-old brother stopped in the convenience store on the way to pick her up. Two men followed her from the convenience store, and as soon as she parked in the driveway of the captain's house, they came and demanded money, and she gave it to them, but that wasn't all. One of the men shot her before he left. The little boy ran into the house and broke in on the prayer meeting. My mom's been shot. They all ran out, but the mother soon died. There was a prayer meeting in progress when this happened. If you were praying for something good, and this occurred, would you give up? Is it no use to pray? Where else can you go? Where can you get that inner comfort that you're going to need? That inner strength? What fairness is there when someone is loyal and prays to God, yet still tragedy strikes? What people don't always realize is that he goes through our ordeals with us and brings us safely through. We don't always know how God works. It seems like we walk uphill, find a little relief, and then have to go uphill again. That's one of the songs that we sing to encourage one another. You've been climbing a hill all your life. It levels and then another hill comes and you climb again. Now, I'm praying that things level off and you might see better days ahead. In his mysterious ways, a great blessing, someone we had not thought of before may come in and give us the strength to get up. Give us the strength. Give us the guidance we need. In his mysterious way, a great blessing, something we had not thought of before, may come in and give us that strength, give us the guidance we need. We should let him do the driving of our lives. He knows the best way to get from here to there. Maybe he has to take us by a longer route and 
order to get there, but it might be the safer way. In the Bible, there was a devout man named Job who believed in the living God. Satan came to God and said, he's not so much, I can sway him. So God allowed Satan to do whatever he wanted, short of taking Job's life. And all the hardships that you could imagine happened to Job, enough to shake anyone's faith, enough to blame God for the misfortunes and shake a fist to him. But God did not intervene. Job had great possessions, gone. His ten children died. Maybe other people would have been swayed, but Job's own faith kept him from denying God. And at the very end, after everything was over with, because of his faithfulness to God, he was given twofold of everything he'd lost, and he and his wife had ten more children. If someone has faith like that, he cannot be severed from his initial belief. There are times in a person's life when he feels he come to the end of his rope. Still, there must be a reason for tests. So, instead of blaming God and saying, have you forgotten me? Except that the Supreme Being never abandons us. He never forgets us. He's always there, day and night looking after us. Before the coming of Christianity, our people felt that they had something spiritually substantial. Um, using the word spiritual to mean something that we can hold on to with our faith and not to swerve from. Regardless of what happens to us, when my tribe was being forced out of what is now Georgia and Alabama on our way to Indian Territory, the hardships were severe, and yet our people did not give up. There's one story about a mother and child being left behind because the child was ill and they couldn't keep up with the rest of the group. People hated to leave them, but the soldiers forced the others to go on and the mother and child were left behind. She kept saying, keep up the faith wherever you go, wherever you are headed, keep the faith going. And out of that, many of our people began to make up songs. Keep the faith, keep the faith. Collectively, our people were kind of like Job. When everything was lost, they didn't lose their faith and their belief in the Supreme Being. Sometimes our good feelings drain out when difficulties happen, but it's not the end of life. It's a challenge and we go on. We're strengthened. There are many spiritual paths, but only one spirit. You have the spirit, don't let go. Sometimes the faith becomes like a little candle instead of a bonfire, and the winds come and almost blow it out, but it's still flickering on. And as long as it's still burning, it has the potential of carrying forth the realization of our hopes and our dreams. If we're going to fail, it's better to fail trying than just giving up. Rededication. When I was old enough to understand it, my mother told me this story. When you were a little tiny baby, you got sick and we thought you were going to die. You had a real hot fever and I sat in a rocking chair and rocked you all night long. Neighbors wanted to relieve me and take you, but I wouldn't let them. I just held you in my arms all night. Early in the morning, just before the sun was coming up, I took you outside and facing east, dedicated your life to our Creator. I said, if you let this child live, I will do my best to be a good mother. I will raise him knowing something about you and your great love, so that he can walk this earth and be of help to people. He will be your feet, your eyes, your voice, your hands. However, you can use him. I dedicate him to you now. After she came back in the house, the fever broke and I got well. From the early beginning, a sense of dedication was instilled in me. Many years later, I had to rededicate my life. I had a son who volunteered for the service. He chose the Coast Guard because it was the kind of service that helped other people in distress. Before leaving for a year's duty in the Philippines, he had a month's leave of absence and came home to visit us. 
he brought me a new hat and took me to a birthday dinner. We did a lot together that month. At the end of the month, on his way to the Philippines, wearing the uniform of our country, his plane stopped to refuel in Hawaii. He sent a doll to his sister, an orchid to his mother, and a postcard to me with hula girls on the front. He knew his dad. He wrote on the card, this is a beautiful place. I hope you see it someday. He had sent the orchid to his mother because it was May 11th, 1964, Mother's Day. He was still thinking of us. He was still thinking of home. When they refueled and he went on to the Philippines, then during a normal landing and fair weather, due to human error, the plane crashed and 84 men died. And my son was one of them. We got the gifts after a crash, after he had already gone on, just to touch what he had touched, even the card, how he scribbled on it. I held it to my heart. There was no way to describe the feeling of loss that engulfs you, and a table that is set with one plate missing really takes something out of your heart. Not too many years afterwards, I went to Hawaii, a fulfillment of my son's wish that I could see it. In Hawaii, there's a place called Pele Point, where, according to Hawaiian legends, the winds of the universe have their beginning. Because my mother is of the Wind Clan, I wanted to go up there at midnight, because the guard said, you can't. Why? We closed the gates. I said, I don't care. I want to go up there. We'll take you as far as the chain across the road. So they drove me as far as they could. Then I walked the rest of the way and sang my song to each of the four directions, east, south, west, and north. When I got through, I said, my mother, when I was very small, dedicated me. At this time, I rededicate myself anew to you from my heart. I will be your feet, your hands, your eyes, your voice. Just as she said, if there is any love that you have a special love that you want for the people, let it flow through me. Let me touch someone to make them a little happier so that they can be well and walk with good purpose upon this land. Please use me. I dedicate my life again in that way. When I came back down, the guards asked who was up there with me. I said no one. They said they heard lots of voices singing. They heard it. I didn't. <laughs>